Black Bargain by Robert Block. It was getting late when I switched off the neon and got busy behind the fountain with my silver polish. The fruit syrup came off easily, but the chocolate stuck and the hot fudge was greasy. I wished to the devil they wouldn't order hot fudge. I began to get irritated as I scrubbed away. Five hours on my feet every night? And what did I have to show for it? Varicose veins. Varicose veins and the memory of a thousand foolish faces. The veins were easier to bear than the memories. They were so depressing, those customers of mine. I knew them all by heart. In the early evening, all I got was cokes. I could spot the cokes a mile away. Giggling high school girls with long shocks of uncombed brown hair. Their shapeless tan fingertip coats and the repulsively thick legs bulging over furry red ankle socks. They were all cokes for 45 minutes. They'd monopolize a booth, messing up the tile tabletop with cigarette ashes, crushed napkins, daubed in lipstick, and little puddles of spilled water. Whenever a high school girl came in, I automatically reached for the cola pump. A little later in the evening, I got the give-me-two-packs crowd. Sports shirts hanging limply over hairy arms meant the popular brands. Blue work shirts with rolled sleeves disclosing tattooing meant for the two-for-a-quarter cigarettes. Once in a while, I got a fat boy. He was always a cigar. If he wore glasses, he was a ten-center. If not, I merely had to indicate the box on the counter. Five cents straight, mild Havana all-long filler. Oh, it was monotonous. The Notions family, who invariably departed with aspirin, x lax candy bars, and a pint of ice cream. The public library crowd. Tall, skinny youth spending the pages of magazines on the rack and never buying. The soda waters with their trousers wrinkled by the sofa of a one-room apartment. The hairpins always looking furtively towards the baby buggy outside. And around ten, the... Pineapple Sundays, women, bingo players, followed by the chocolate sodas when the show let out. More booth parties, giggling girls, red-necked young men in sloppy play suits. In and out, all day long, the rushing telephones, the doddering old three-cent stamps, the bachelor toothpastes and razor blades. I could spot them all at a glance. Night after night, they dragged up to the counter. I don't know why they even bothered to tell me what they wanted. One look was all I needed to anticipate their slightest wishes. I could have given them what they needed without their asking. Or rather, I suppose I couldn't. Because what most of them really needed was a good long drink of arsenic, as far as I was concerned. Arsenic! Good lord, how long had it been since I'd been called upon to fill out a prescription? None of these idiots wanted drugs from a drugstore. Why had I bothered to study pharmacy? All I really needed was a two-week course in pouring chocolate syrup over melting ice cream and a month's study of how to set up cardboard figures in the window so as to emphasize their enormous busts. He came in then. I heard the slow footsteps without bothering to look up. For amusement, I tried to guess beforehand. Uh, give me two packs, maybe? A toothpaste? Well, to hell with him. I was closing up. The footsteps had shuffled up to the counter before I raised my head. They halted, timidly. I still refused to give any recognition of his presence. Then came a hesitant cough. That did it. I found myself staring at a Casper milk toast, and nearly rags, a middle-aged, thin little fellow with sandy hair and rimless glasses perched on a snub nose. The crease of his froggish mouth underlined the despair of his face. He wore a frayed... $16.50 suit, a wrinkled white shirt, and a string tie, but humility was his real garment. It covered him completely. That aura of hopeless resignation. To hell with psychoanalysis. I am not the drugstore Dale Carnegie. What I saw added up to only one thing in mind. A moocher. I beg your pardon, please, but do you have any tincture of aconite? Well... Miracles do happen. I was going to get the chance to sell drugs after all. Or was I? When despair walks in and asks for aconite, it means suicide. I shrugged. Aconite, I echoed. I don't know. He smiled a little, or rather, that crease wrinkled back in a poor imitation of amusement. 
but on his face a smile had no more mirth in it than the grin you so you see on a skull. I, I know what you're thinking, he mumbled, but you're wrong. I, I'm a chemist. I'm doing some experiments, and, and I must have four ounces of aconite at once. And and some belladonna. Yes. And, um, oh, uh, wait a minute. He then dragged the book out of his pocket, and I, I craned my neck. The book had uh, rusty metal covers. It was obviously very old. When the thick yellow pages fluttered open under his trembling thumb, I saw flecks of dust rise from the binding. The heavy, black-lettered type was German, but I couldn't read anything at that distance. Uh, let me see now, uh, he murmured. Aconite, belladonna, yes. And I have some of this, uh, cat, of course, uh, nightshade, mm -hmm, yes, I'll need some phosphorus, of course. Uh, have you any blue chalk? You know, uh, good, okay. And I guess that's all. I was beginning to catch on, but what in the devil did it matter to me? A screwball, more or less, was nothing new in my life. All I wanted to do was get out of here and soak my feet. I went back and got the stuff for him. Quickly. I peered through the slot above the pre prescription counter. But he wasn't doing anything, just paging through that black, iron-bound book and moving his lips. Wrapping the parcel, I came out. Anything else, sir? Uh, oh, oh, yes. Could I have about a dozen candles, the large size? I opened a drawer and scrabbled for them under the dust. I'll have to melt them down and re-blend them in with the fat, he said. What? Oh, n nothing. I was just figuring. Sure, that's the kind of figuring you do when you're counting the pads in your cell. But it wasn't my business, was it? So, I handed over the package, like a fool. Oh, thank you. You've been very kind. I, I must ask you to be kinder, you know, to charge this. Ah, swell. You see, I'm I'm temporarily out of funds, but I, I can assure you in a very short time, in fact, within three days, I shall pay you in full. Yes. A very convincing plea. I wouldn't give him a cup of coffee on it, and... That's what bums usually ask for, instead of aconite and candles, but if his words didn't move me, his eyes did. They were so lonely behind his spectacles. So pitifully alone. Those two little puddles of hope in the desert of despair that was his face. All right, let him have his dreams. Let him take his old, iron-bound dream book home with him. Let him light his tapers and draw his phosphorescent circle, and recite his spells to the spirit world, or whatever the hell he wanted to do. No, I wouldn't give him coffee, but hey, I'd give him a dream. That's okay, buddy. We're all down on our luck sometimes, I said. That was wrong. I shouldn't have patronized. He stiffened at once, and his mouth curled into a sneer of superiority. If you please. I'm not asking for charity, he said. You'll get paid. Never fear, my good man. In three days, mark my words. Now, good evening. I have work to do. Out he marched, leaving my good man with his mouth open. Eventually, I closed my mouth, but I couldn't clamp a lid on my curiosity. That night, walking home, I looked down the dark street with a new interest. The black houses bulked like a barrier behind which lurked fantastic mysteries. Row upon row, not houses anymore, but dark dungeons of dreams. In what house did my stranger hide? In what room was he intoning to what strange gods? Once again I sensed the presence of wonder in the world, of lurking strangeness behind the scenes of drugstore and apartment house civilization. Black books were still read. Wild-eyed strangers walked and muttered. Candles burned into the night. And a missing alley cat might mean a chosen sacrifice? But my feet hurt, so I went home. Same old malted milks, cherry cokes, Vaseline, Listerine, hairnets, bathing caps, cigarettes, and what have you. Me, I had a headache. It was four days later, almost the same time of night when I found myself scrubbing off the soda taps again. Sure enough, he walked in. I kept telling myself all evening that I didn't expect him. But I did expect him, really. I had a crawling feeling when the door clicked. I waited for the shuffle of the Tom McCann shoes. Instead, there was a brisk tapping of Oxfords, English Oxfords, the $18.50 kind. 
I looked up in a hurry this time. It was my stranger. At least he was there, someplace beneath the flashy blue pinstripe of his suit, the immaculate shirt and fullered tie. He'd had a shave, a haircut, a manicure, and evidently a winning ticket in the Irish sweepstakes. Hello there. Nothing wrong with that voice. I heard it in the ritzy hotel lobbies for years, brimming over with pep and confidence and authorities. Well, 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 was all I could say. He chuckled. His mouth wasn't a crease anymore. It was a trumpet of command. Out of that mouth could come orders and directions. This wasn't a mouth shaped for hesitant excuses any longer. It was a mouth for requesting expensive dinners. Choice vintage wines, heavy cigars. A mouth that barked at taxi drivers and doormen. Surprised to see me, eh? Well, I told you it would take three days. Want to pay you your money. Thank you for your kindness. That was nice. Not the things. The money. I like money. The thought of getting some I didn't expect made me... Jovial. So your prayers were answered, eh? I said. He frowned. Prayers? What prayers? Uh, well, I thought that. I'd, I'd pulled a boner, no mistake. I don't understand, he snapped, understanding perfectly well. Did you perhaps harbor some misapprehension concerning my purchases the other evening? A few necessary chemicals. That's all, to complete the experiment I spoke of. And the candles, I must confess, were to light my room. They shut my electricity off the day before. Might as well tell you, the experiment was a howling success. Yes, sir. Went right down to Newsome with the results, and they put me on as the assistant research director. Quite a break. Newsome was the biggest chemical supply house in our section of the country, and he went right down in his rags and was put on as the assistant research director? Well, live and learn. So here's the money. Two dollars thirty-nine, wasn't it? Can you change a twenty? I couldn't. That's all right. Keep it. I refused. I don't know why. Made me feel crawling somehow. Well then, tell you what let's do. You're closing up, aren't you? Why not step down the street to the tavern for a little drink? I'll get changed there. Come on. I feel like celebrating. So it was that five minutes later I walked down the street with Mr. Fritz Gulther. We took a table in the tavern and ordered quickly. Neither he nor I was at ease. Somehow there was an unspoken secret between us. It seems almost as though I harbored criminal knowledge against him. I, of all men, alone knowing that behind this immaculately clad figure of success, there lurked a shabby specter just three days in the past. A specter that owed me two dollars and thirty-nine cents. We drank quickly, both of us. The specter got a little fainter. We had another, and I insisted on paying for the third round. It's a celebration, I argued. <laughs> Certainly is, and let me tell you, this is only the beginning. Only the beginning. From now on, I'm going to climb so fast it'll make your head swim. I'll be running that place within six months. Going to get a lot of new defense orders in from the government. Expand, you know? Wait a minute, I cautioned. Reserve gone. You're way ahead of yourself. If I were in your shoes, I'd still be dazed with what happened to me in the last three days. Fritz Gulther smiled. Oh, that? I expected that. Didn't I tell you so in the store? I've been working for over a year, and I, I knew just what to expect. It was no surprise, I assure you. I had it all planned. I was willing to starve to carry out my necessary studies, and I did starve. Might as well admit it. Sure. I was on my fourth drink now, over the barriers. When you came into the store, I said so myself. Here's a guy who's been through hell. Truer words have never been spoken, said Gulther. I've been through hell, all right. Quite literally. <laughs> but it's all over now, and I didn't get burned. Say, confidentially, what kind of magic did you use? The magic? I don't know anything about magic. Oh, yes, you do, Gulther, I said. What about that little black book with the iron covers you were mumbling about within the store? German inorganic chemistry text, he snapped. Pretty old. Here, drink up and have another. I did have another. Gulther began to babble a bit about his new clothes, his new apartment, and the new car he was going to buy next week. 
about how he was going to have everything he wanted. And by God, he'd show the fools that laughed at him all these years. He'd pay back the nagging landladies and the cursing grocers and the sneering rats who told him he was soft in the head for studying the way he did. Then he got into the kindly stage. How'd you like a job at Newsom? He asked me. You're a good pharmacist. You know your chemistry. You're a nice enough fellow, but you've got a terrible imagination. How about it? Be my secretary. Sure, that's it. Be my secretary. I'll put you on tomorrow. <laughs> I'll drink on that, I declared. The prospect intoxicated me. The thought of escape from the damned store, escape from the coke faces, the ciggies' voices, very definitely intoxicated me. And so did the next drink. I began to see something. We were sitting against the wall and the tavern lights were low. Couples around us were babbling in monotone. That was akin to silence. We sat in shadow against the wall. Now I looked over at my shadow and ungainly, flickering caricature of myself, hunched over the table. What a contrast it presented. Before his, suddenly erect bulk. His shadow now. His shadow now. I saw it. He was sitting up, straight across the table from me. But his shadow on the wall, was standing. <laughs> no more scotch for me, I said as the waiter came up, but I continued to stare at his shadow. He was sitting, and the shadow was definitely standing. It was a larger shadow than mine, and a blacker shadow. For fun, I moved my hands up and down, making heads and faces in the silhouette. He wasn't watching me. He was gesturing to the waiter. His shadow didn't gesture. It stood there. I watched and stared and tried to look away. His hands moved, but the black outline stood poised, silent, hands dangling at the sides. And yet I saw the familiar shape of his head and nose, unmistakably his. Say, Gother, I said. Your shadow here on the wall. I slurred my words. My eyes were blurred but I felt his attitude pierce my consciousness below the alcohol. Fritz Gulther rose to his feet and then shoved a dead white face against mine. He didn't look at his shadow. He looked at me, through me, at some horror behind my face, my thoughts, my brain. He looked at me and into some private hell of his own. Shadow, he said. There's nothing wrong with my shadow. You're mistaken. Remember that you're mistaken, and if you ever mention it again, I'll bash your skull in. Then Fritz Gulther got up and walked away. I watched him march across the room, moving swiftly, a little unsteadily, behind him, moving very slowly and not a bit unsteadily. A tall, black shadow followed him from the room. If you can build a better mousetrap than your neighbor, you're liable to put your foot in it. That's certainly what I had done with Gulther. Here I was, ready to accept his offer of a good job as his secretary, and I had to go and pull a drunken boner. I was still cursing myself for a fool two days later. Shadows that don't follow body movements? Indeed. Who was that shadow I saw you drinking with last night? That was no shadow. That was the scotch I was drinking. So I stood in the drugstore and sprinkled my Sundays with curses as well as chopped nuts. I nearly knocked the pecans off the counter that second night when Fritz Gulther walked in again. He hurried up to the counter and flashed me a tired smile. Got a minute to spare? Uh, sure. <laughs> Wait till I serve these people in the booth. I dumped the Sundays and raced back. Gulther perched himself on a stool and took off his hat. He was sweating profusely. Say, I, I want to apologize for the way I blew up the other night. Oh, why, well, that's all right, Mr. Gulther. I got a little too excited, that's all. Liquor and success went to my head. No hard feelings. I, I want you to understand that. It's just that I, I was nervous. You're ribbing me about my shadow. That stuff sounded too much like the way I was always kitted for sticking to my studies. Landlady used to accuse me of all sorts of things. Claimed I dissected her cat. 
that I was burning incense, messing up the floor with chalk. Some damn fool college punks downstairs began to yap around that I was some sort of nut dabbling in witchcraft. I wasn't asking for his autobiography, remember? All this sounded a little hysterical, but then Gulther looked the part, his sweating, the way his mouth wobbled and twitched as he got this out of me. But say, no reason I, I stopped in was to see if you could fix me up a sedative. No, no bromo or aspirin. I've been taking plenty of that stuff. My nerves are all shot. That uh, job of mine takes it all out of me. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll get some. I made for the back room. As I compounded, I sneaked a look at Gulther through the slot. All right, all right, I'll be honest. It wasn't Gulther I wanted to look at. It was his shadow. When a customer sits at the counter stools, the store light hits him so that his shadow is just a little black pool beneath his feet. Gulther's shadow was a complete silhouette of his body in outline, a black, deep shadow. I blinked, but that didn't help. Stranger still, the shadow seemed to be cast parallel with his body instead of it at an angle from it. It grew out from his chest instead of his legs. I don't know refraction, the laws of light, all that technical stuff. All I know is that Fritz Gulther had a big black shadow sitting beside him on the floor. And that the sight of it sent cold shivers along my spine. This time I wasn't drunk. And neither was he, and neither was the shadow. All three of us existed. Now Gulther was putting his hat back on, but not the shadow. It just sat there, crouched. It was all wrong. The shadow was no denser at one spot than at the other. It was evenly dark, and I noted this particularly. The outlines did not blur or fade. They were solid. I stared and I stared. I saw a lot now I'd never noticed. The shadow wore no clothes, of course. Why should it put on a hat? It was naked, that shadow, but it belonged to Gulther. It wore spectacles. It was his shadow. Which suited me fine, because I, I didn't want it. Fiddling around, compounding that sedative, I got in several more peaks. Now Gulther was looking over his shoulder. He was looking at his shadow. Now, even from a distance, I fancied I saw new beads of sweat string a rosary of fear across his forehead. He knew, all right. I came out, finally. Here it is, I said. I kept my eyes from his face. Good. Uh, I hope it works. Let's get some sleep and say that a uh, job offer still goes. How about coming down tomorrow morning? I nodded, forcing a smile. Gulther paid me and then rose. See you then. Certainly, I replied. And why not? After all, what if you do work for a boss with an unnatural shadow? Most bosses have other faults, worse ones and more concrete. That shadow, whatever it was, and whatever was wrong with it, it wouldn't bite me. Though Gulther acted as though it might bite him. As he turned away, I looked at his departing back and at the long, swooping black outline which followed it. The shadow rose and stalked after him. Stalked, yes, it followed him quite purposefully. To my now bewildered eyes, it seemed larger than it had in the tavern. Larger and a bolder, deeper black. Then the knight swallowed Gulther and his non-existent companion. I went back to the rear of the store and swallowed the other half of the sedative I've made up for that purpose. After seeing that shadow, I needed it as much as he did. The girl in the ornate outer office smiled prettily. Go right in, she warbled. He's expecting you. So it was true then. Gulther was the assistant research director, and I was to be his secretary. I floated in. In the morning sunshine, I forgot all about shadows. The inner office was elaborately furnished, a huge place with elegant walnut paneling associated with business authority. There was a kidney desk set before closed Venetian blinds and a variety of comfortable leather armchairs. Fluorescent lighting gleamed pleasantly. But there was no Gulther, probably on the other side of the little door at the back talking to his chief. I sat down with the tight feeling of anticipation, hugged somewhere within my stomach. I glanced around, taking in the room again. My gaze swept at the glass-topped desk. It was bare, except in the corner where a small box of cigars rested. 
No, wait a minute. That wasn't a cigar box. It was metal. I've seen that somewhere before. Ah, uh, yes, of course. It was Gulther's iron-bound book. German inorganic chemistry. Who was I to doubt his word? So naturally, I just had to sneak a look before he came in. I opened the yellow pages. De Vermis Mysteries. Mysteries of the Worm. This was no inorganic chemistry text. It was something entirely different. Something that told you how you could compound aconite and belladonna and draw circles of phosphorescent fire on the floor when the stars were right. Something that spoke of melting tallow candles and blending them with corpse fat, whispered of uses to which animal sacrifice might be put. It spoke of meetings that could be arranged with various parties most people don't either care to meet or believe in. Thick black letters crawled across the pages, and the detestable odor arising from the musty thing formed a background for the nastiness of the text. I won't say whether or not I believed what I was reading, but I will admit there was an air, a suggestion about those cold, deliberate directions for traffic, with an alien evil which made me shiver with repulsion. Such thoughts have no place in sanity, even as fantasy, and if this is what Gother had done with the materials, he'd bought himself for $2.39. Years of study, eh? Experiments? What was Gother trying to call up? What did he call up? And what bargain did he make? The man who could answer these questions sidled out from behind the door. Gone was the Fritz Gother of the pinstripe suit personality. It was my original Casper Milktoast who creased his mouth at me in abject fear. He looked like a man, I hate to say it, who was afraid of his own shadow. The shadow trailed him through the doorway. To my eyes, it had grown overnight. Its arms were slightly raised, though Gulther had both hands pressed against his sides. I saw it cross the wall as he walked towards me, and it moved more swiftly than he did. Make no mistake, I saw that shadow. Since then, I've talked to wise boys who assure me that, under even fluorescence, no shadow is cast. They're wise all right, but I saw that shadow. Gulther saw the book in my hands. All right, he said. You know. And maybe it's just as well. No, I said. Yes, know that I made a bargain with someone. I thought I was being smart. He promised me success and wealth, anything I wanted, on only one condition. <laughs> Those damn conditions. You always read about them and you always forget, because they sound so foolish. He told me that I'd have only one rival, and this rival would be a part of myself. It would grow with my success. I sat mute. Gulther was wound up for a long time. <laughs> Silly, wasn't it? Of course I accepted. And then I found out what my rival was. What it would be. A shadow of mine. It's independent of me, you know. And it keeps growing. Oh, not in size, but in depth. It's becoming... Oh, maybe I am crazy, but you see it too. Solid, thicker, as though it has a palpable substance. Crease mouth wobbled violently, but the words choked on. The further I go, the more it grows. Last night I took your sedative and it didn't work. Didn't work at all. I sat up in the darkness and I watched my shadow. In darkness? Yeah, it doesn't need light. It exists now, permanently. In the dark, it's just a blacker blur. But you can see it. It doesn't sleep or rest. It just waits. And you're afraid of it? Why? I don't know. It doesn't threaten me or make gestures or take any notice of me. Shadows taking notice sounds... <laughs> but you see, you see it as I do. You can see it in waiting, and that's why I'm afraid. What's it waiting for? The shadow crept closer over his shoulder, eavesdropping. I don't need you for a secretary. I need a nurse. What you need is a good rest. Rest? How can I rest? I just came out of Newsom's office. He doesn't notice anything yet. Too stupid, I suppose. The girls in the office look at me when I pass, and I wonder if they see something particular. But Newsom doesn't. He just made me head of research, completely in charge. In five days? 
Marvelous, I said. Isn't it? Except for our bargain whenever I succeed, my rival gains power with me. That will make the shadows stronger. How? I, I don't know. I'm waiting, and I can't find rest. I'll find it for you, I said. Just lie down and wait, and I will be back. I left him hastily, left him sitting at his desk all alone. Well, not quite alone. His shadow was there, too. Before I went, I had the funniest temptation. I wanted to run my hand along the wall through that shadow, and yet I didn't. It was too black, too solid. What if my hand should actually encounter something? So I just left. I was back in half an hour. I grabbed Golther's arm, bared it, and plunged the needle home. Morphine. You'll sleep now, I whispered. He did, resting on the leather sofa. I sat at his side, watching the shadow that didn't sleep. It stood there, towering above him unnaturally. I tried to ignore it, but it was a third party in the room. Once, when I turned my back, it moved. It began to pace up and down. I opened my mouth, trying to hold back a scream. The phone buzzed. I answered mechanically, my eyes never leaving the black outline on the wall that swayed over Gulther's recumbent form. Uh, yes? No, he, he's not in right now. This is Mr. Gulther's secretary speaking. Your message? Oh, yes, I'll, I'll tell him, certainly. Uh, thank you. It had been a woman's voice, a deep, rich voice. Her message was to tell Mr. Golther she'd changed her mind. She'd be happy to meet him that evening at dinner. Another conquest for Fritz Golther. Conquest two, conquest in a row? That meant conquests for the shadow, too. But how? I turned to the shadow on the wall and got a shock. It was lighter, grayer, thinning, wavering a little. What was wrong? I glanced down at Gulther's sleeping face. Then I got another shock. Gulther's face was dark. Not tanned, but dark. Sooty. Shadowy. Then I did scream a little. Gulther awoke suddenly. I just pointed to his face and indicated the wall mirror. He almost fainted. It's combining with me, he whispered. His skin was slate-colored. I turned my back because I couldn't look at him. We must do something, he mumbled. Fast. Perhaps if you were to use that book again, you could make another bargain. It was a fantastic idea, but it popped out. I faced Gulther again and saw his smile. That's it. If you could get the materials. Now, now you know what I need. Go to the drugstore, but hurry up, because... And I shook my head. Gulther was nebulous, shimmery. I saw him through a mist. And then I heard him yell. You damn fool, look at me. That's my shadow you're staring at. I ran out of the room, and in less than ten minutes, I was trying to fill a vial with belladonnas, with fingers that trembled like lumps of jelly. I must have looked like a fool carrying that armful of packages through the outer office. Candles, chalk, phosphorus, aconite, belladonna, and blame it on my hysteria, the dead body of an alley cat. Certainly, I felt like a fool when Fritz Gulther met me at the door of his sanctum. Come in, he snapped. Yes, snapped. It only took a glance to convince me that Gulther was himself again. Whatever the black change that frightened us so bad, he'd shook it off for a while I was gone. Once again, the trumpet voice held authority. Once again, the sneering smile replaced the apologetic crease in his mouth. Gulther's skin was normal. His movements were brisk and no longer frightened. He didn't need any wild spells, or had he ever, really? Suddenly, I felt as though I'd been a victim of my own imagination. After all, men don't make bargains with demons. They don't change places with their shadows. The moment Gulther closed the door, his words corroborated my mood. Well, I've snapped out of it. Foolish nonsense, wasn't it? He smiled easily. Guess we won't need that junk after all. Right when you left, I began to feel better. Here, sit down. Take it easy. I sat. Gulther rested on the desk, nonchalantly swinging his legs. All that nervousness, that strain had just disappeared. But before I forget, I'd like to apologize for telling you that crazy story about sorcery and whatnot. Matter of fact, I'd feel better about the whole thing in the future if you just forget it all happened. I nodded, and Gulther smiled again. That's right. Now we're ready to get down to business, I tell you. It's a real relief to realize the progress we're going to make. 
I'm head research director already. And if I play my cards right, I think I'll be running this place in another three months. Some of the things Newsom told me today tipped me off. So just play ball with me and we'll go a long way. A long way. And I can promise you one thing. I'll never have any of those spells again. There was nothing wrong with what Gulther said here. Nothing wrong with any of it. There was nothing wrong with the way Gulther lolled and smiled at me either. Then why did I suddenly get that old crawling sensation along my spine? For a moment, I couldn't place it. And then I realized Fritz Gulther sat on his desk before the wall. But now he cast no shadow. No shadow at all. A shadow had tried to enter the body of Fritz Gulther when I left, and now there was no shadow at all. Where had it gone? Well, there was only one place for it to go. And if it had gone there, then where was Fritz Gulther? He read it in my eyes. I read it in his swift gesture. Gulther's hand dipped into his pocket and re-emerged. As it rose, I rose and sprang across the room. I gripped the revolver, pressed it back and away, and stared into his convulsed countenance, into his eyes, behind the glasses, behind the human pupils. There was only a blackness, the cold, grinning darkness of a shadow. Then he snarled, arms clawing up as he tried to wrest the weapon free. Aim it. His body was cold, curiously weightless, but filled with a slithering strength. I felt myself go limp under those icy, scrabbling talons, but as I gazed into those two dark pools of hate that were his eyes, fear and desperation lent me aid. A single gesture, and I turned the muzzle in. The gun exploded, and Gunther slumped to the floor. They crowded in then. They stood and stared down, too. We all stood and stared down at the body lying on the floor. Body? There was Fritz's Gulther's shoes, his shirt, his tie his expensive blue pinstripe suit. The toes of the shoes pointed up. The shirt and tie and suit were creased and filled out to support a body beneath. But there was no body on the floor. There was only a shadow, a deep black shadow, encased in Fritz Gulther's clothes. Nobody said a word for a long time. Then one of the girls whispered, Look, it, it's just a shadow. I bent down quickly and shook the clothes. As I did so, the shadow seemed to move beneath my fingers, to move and melt. In an instant, it slithered free from the garments. There was a flash or a final retinal imp impression of blackness, and the shadow was gone. The clothes sagged down to an empty, huddled heap on the floor. I rose and faced them. I, I couldn't say it out loud, but I could say it gratefully, very gratefully. No, I said. You're mistaken. There's no shadow there. There's nothing at all. There's absolutely nothing at all. <laughs>